your blood work, this is what you will see for a normal person. Certainly these numbers will some between lab to lab, a person to, but this is a rough idea, right? And what I wanna point your attention to, right, is here, let me, some green color. So you see, right, we're gonna use the deciliter. This is our reference range, right? We're not gonna use the system international for now because you guys are employing your glucometer. This is what you're gonna read, right? We, uh, if we if you check a normal person blood glucose level, it's about 70 to 110. But in this you know book, that's what they reference. We said less than uh, 60. You're gonna probably intervene. Maybe you give uh, you know dextrose, right? Uh, or you give glucose, oral glucose of the person you follow, uh, or to gain IV access, you uh, give them some medications called glucagon. We'll talk about what that is more in depth and the current chapter, but for now, testing state of glucose in your blood, right? 70 to 110 milligrams per deciliter, right? So uh, what is, you know, what is uh, all this business, right? I'm going to, I'm going to draw this out. I'm going to make a schematic for you so you understand. I'm going to start simple and then it's going to become a little bit more involved. But initially, if you understand uh, this portion, right? Uh, I think it's going to serve you very well so let's start so i'm gonna draw a, this is gonna be your stomach right so we said that uh we we have uh amylase uh salivary amylase that starts to chop up uh um uh or uh foods that you're consuming making it into mono you also have uh from right you have uh, uh, amylase that's coming in and chopping up. I'm just going to make it simple, and I'm going to say, uh, you know, glucose is coming in, right? And through the different ends, basically, it, it got chopped up into glucose. So glucose is coming through your tract, and then at, at this portion, right, your digestive tract is going to make contact, right, with the liver and this is going to be via the hepatic from the liver portal vein so we're going to say glucose that was coming the gi tract makes its way to the hepatic portal vein and this is now going to your liver like a liver here liver as you guys know has two lobes and it has cells in the liver called hepatocytes And uh, liver has uh, uh, one ability, even if you take other monosaccharides, right, such as fructose or galactose, it can, it can basically turn it into glucose. So the final thing will be glucose, uh, and it has the capability of basically monosaccharides and turning them into glucose. Uh, and afterwards, right, uh, from here, right, we're going to say uh, hepatic vein, which essentially brings this back into the, you know, circulation. We're going to say this is your circulation. All right, so glucose is uh, going to be coming inside to be utilized, right, for other cells. And glucose is coming into your central circulation. And I'm going to draw just a couple of cells outside. This could be any cells. This could be your muscle cells, you know, uh, your kidney cells, or any other cells in your body. Now, uh, you the following. So based on what I explained so far, if I check, if I use a glucometer and I check your, and we said this is normal, person, right? What should the glucose be here? What is the level of glucose in your blood, 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 bloodstream? If I check it. It should be like around 100. Yeah. So we said it was between 70 to let's just say 100 milligrams. Right? So this is what's the normal, right? Now here, this is inside the cell. So this is the intracellular fluid 
right? So all these cells have intracellular, and this is our extracellular fluid. This could be like the interstitial space. So there's basically space in between these cells. So my question then goes, right? Oh, right, the blood, right? This is your system, circulation. The, inside the circulatory system, glucose is 70 to 100 milligrams per deciliter. My question is, what is the level in this extracellular fluid that is in between the cells? Is it more, less? It's, uh, it should be the yes. same. It should be. Uh, who's who's saying the same? Aaron. Um, I, who was that? Aaron. Aaron. Okay. Aaron saying. Okay. Aaron saying. Okay. The glucose should be the same, right? He says glucose seven to one hundred in the circulation should be the same in the interstitial. Does anyone disagree? I disagree. Okay. Syed, what do you think it should be? I think it should be a lot less or not. So let's say let's say we say a 100 is our norm. Let's say we use 100 as our normal. Say it. how much would um, you do? I, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to say like 30. But but the, the reason why I disagree is because like, uh, like I remember you once mentioned like an inter uh, wait, um, cerebral spinal fluid mm -hmm. has glucose in it mm -hmm. and regular fluid doesn't. So mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know. I'm just guessing. Something yeah. Like that. Okay. So, uh, okay, so that's what he's saying. He's saying it's about 30. He's giving a reference of the CSF, right? Uh, okay, anyone else have any alternate? Anyone thinks it's higher? I mean, I'm going to say it's higher mm -hmm. because the glucose hasn't been used up yet or hasn't oh, been distributed. How much? Um, I'm going to say maybe... 200 200 okay so so we have somebody says it's 30 somebody says it's the same so we're gonna say and someone says it's 200 so truly so truly truly speaking right from your circulation right you have uh capillaries right capital i'm gonna make the capillary networks maybe in green right so in the capillary network glucose is able to freely right come in and out of the circulation system so truly speaking, it's going to be close to the normal levels of the glucose found in your blood. Uh, if you this is close to 100, right? This is what we're going to find. Cer certainly, this this number will change, right? Depending of the uptake of the cell. So, like, let's say if this cell requires a lot of glucose and starts to big, pick up glucose, right? As this number is going down, more glucose is going to come out from the bloodstream to equilibrate to uh, 100, right? Now. So the extracellular fluid is about 100. So we're going to say extracellular fluid is about 100 milligrams per deciliter. It's usually very similar, very close to the amount of glucose found in your circulatory system. My second question is now, what is the level of glucose, right? Let's say this is your muscle cell. We're going to pretend this was your muscle cell. Any cell in your body. So my question is, we know that interest extracellular fluid was the same as your circulation what is the intracellular fluid uh intracellular fluid glucose concentration how much glucose is here in the cell is it the same is it more is it less i'm, I'm gonna say more okay steven says more how much more uh, probably a lot a lot more yeah okay. give me a number uh i couldn't i'm gonna 60. go i'm gonna go with three times three times 300 <laughs> right three a hundred times three is 300 right so you, uh, steven says 100 anyone else have different is 300 <laughs> anyone have any alternate ideas it would be the same until if the muscle if we need some more energy or we have some exercise or so it will be more so help me says same. more it still says more right It'd be more. How much more? No, sorry, it's gonna be the same. Exception. It's gonna be the same. Exception if we need more energy, will be increasing. Oh, okay. So Helmi says it sh should be the same, uh, but more, right? It's gonna increase. So we have 
one one per hundred one says it should be the same or increase depending on the needs of the cell so uh, it's a... anyone else this anyone else has alternate i i think it should be um more by like 20 to 30 deciliters a 20 or 30 deciliter so uh aaron i think it was he says maybe it was 120 to 130 right so what you so what you uh so how many was the closest right so on the metabolic demands of the cell so what you what you want to remember for glucose is the following so glucose can easily go in and out of the circulatory system and uh equilibrate in the extracellular but right but this and this does not ever ever this exchange dependent on uh, specific channels right called glut or glucose transporters right so we don't have equilibration of glucose from the extracellular fluid to the intracellular fluid this is done via transporters right and we abbreviate it as glucose and why uh, is it abbreviated is because glucose transport right is either done by facilitated diffusion or it's done by specific right glucose sodium transport or co-transport so we here we're going to focus on facilitated diffusion so what is the facilitated diffusion so normally you know diffusion is the process of movement of solute from high concentration to low concentration and it does through this uh, salt membrane right it just equilibrates but in the setting of glucose it cannot do so unless you have the like, transporters present on the membrane it can only utilize those those specific transporters to right the exchange so to uh let me add a image right so the way uh to show you right how the so let's say this was our muscle cell right the only way this glucose can come from the outside is that we must have these in the membrane and when this glucose binds in those receptors only then this will allow glucose to enter the cells right this receptor that's present on the membrane this facilitated diffusion why is it facilitated diffusion is because uh this transmembrane protein is what facilitates the movement of glucose outside to the inside and this is very important for you to understand that this this does exchange does not occur here the extracellular fluid in the cell it does occur between the system and the cellular fluid now once we understand this basic uh physiology the next thing we got to talk about is business right what is what is this uh glut transporters so in our body we have glucose transporters abbreviation is glut and we have glucose trans and they're they're named one two three four and five right so we have the transporters the ones i'm going to highlight is the ones you really need to know but i'm going to outline uh all five so glucose transporter one and glucose trans they're predominantly found on all cells but the majority majority of them is found in the central nervous system and rbcs right central nervous system and rbcs uh, i'm just gonna draw this is your central nervous system this is your rbc and this is where glucose transporters are found right uh let me ask you this question right we were talking about csf there's there's in there right do you think right do you think the central nervous system right it has these glut transporters do you think it's under influence of insulin or there's no insulin so they need to move that glucose they need insulin aaron says you need insulin right anyone have any other answer You don't need ex you don't need insulin because it goes through the diffusion. It's not you don't need insulin. 
Yeah. So Helmi, so Helmi says you don't need insulin. And he's correct, right? So remember this, this is a very important concept. The central nervous system, right? And your RBCs for that matter, is never, never, never under the mercy of insulin. Because if this was the case, those patients who have diabetes, right? And they don't make insulin, right? Their, they, their central nervous system could never uh, get insulin. So the way those glucose transporters work, they are not insulin dependent, uh, right? So insulin is not needed to transfer glucose from right, the extracellular fluid from here, extracellular fluid to the cell for the central nerve. So you don't, do not need insulin. But type 4, right? Type 4 receptors, glucose type 4 receptors, which are predominantly found in your muscles, and they're found on your adipocytes, right? Which is the uh, so th these are your muscle. This is your or adipocytes. These are uh, insulin dependent. So they're insulin dependent. So what does that mean? It means that they must have coming on the receptor in order to facilitate movement of glucose. So uh, suppo suppose, suppose this is your muscle, right, cell. And we're going to say here on the surface, right, you have your insulin receptor. So this is your insulin receptor. What you know, uh, Inside there's these vesicles, and these have these these transporters on them, and these vesicles, right? The transporters are called GLUT4. But inside the cells, they are not found on the surface, on the initial phase, and there's a lot of, and you don't see them a, a lot on the surface. Why? Because you need insulin to bind in order to start a uh, of glucose transporters to move to the surface. So the moment there's high here, right? There's a lot of glucose. You ate a lot of glucose, and your pancreas, right? Beta cells secrete, right? The insulin binds here. I'm gonna say this is insulin. It's gonna bind on these receptors. This insulin sends signal to these glucose transporters type four, and what they will do, they will start to uh, make their way to the sur uh, uh, surface, right, muscle, and what you're going to see is this develop, right? It's going to embed into that surface, and these glucose are now going to be expressed on the membrane. And now, as more uh, glucose transporters make the way you will see the following situation occurring. So now they will be expressing on the surface of the muscle cell or right? And this glucose then, under the influence of insulin, right, utilizing the glucose type 4 transporter, and now, so what you want to keep in mind, especially when we get into endocrine later on, is that uh, glucose come into muscle or fat tissues under the influence of insulin, right? And what insulin does is under the insulin transmission cellular signaling, it will stimulate glucose type 4 to express on the cell surface to uptake the glucose. So now we talked about glucose type 1 and 3, which is found in central nervous system and red blood cells. We talked about glucose type 4, which is found in muscle and fat sites. Uh, what do you think glucose transporters type 2? Where do you think you were going to find glucose transporters type 2? And uh, the re there is a e remember it, right? If, if I told you this is a two-way transporter. I may find this. You guys can take a guess. Irene, you want to take a guess? Um, I'm sorry, GI tract, lungs? So, uh, not, not on the lungs. 
uh, who, who's, who was saying that? Help me. Peripheral, nephron, uh, peripheral nervous system. So the type 2 transporters, right? So they're the name said, right? Two way, two way transporter. So usually the transporters, the predominance is found in the liver, right? And they're also found in the pancreas. Hmm. I'll tell you why this is important, right? So let's let's start uh, the liver, right? And two way transporters means the following they can go in and out like this. So in the liver, uh, if you recall, one function of the liver is to store glycogen for when we need it, right? So there may be states when we don't have a dose, and liver has to break up glycogen stores, right? So glycogen has to be broken down, and we need to be able to release it. So these uh, glucose type 2 transporters need to be very sensitive, right, uh, to the concentrations of glucose. So two-way transporters to... Uh, Basically, in the states of high concentration, move glucose inside for storage of glycogen, or right in the states of low glucose, they able to do glycogen storage the glucose. So liver does that. Uh, uh, kidney to a small degree, right? Kidney uh, can also make to a small degree. The so liver, and then why do you suppose pancreas? Why pancreas? Why does pancreas have glucose type two? Uh, maybe to help out with the enzymes. So not enzymes, but what does what do you know Enzyme. that that pancreas secretes? What does it release? What hormone? The insulin, the pancreas insulin right? It's it, insulin and glucagon, right? If you secrete insulin and glucagon, you must have two-way transporters to be able to kind of uh, taste the glucose. Should I secrete insulin if it's high glucose, or should I secrete glucagon when it's low glucose? Right. So it, from the physical point, it makes sense, right? So those mm -hmm. organs, right, that are involved in glucose production, right, such as glucagon, right, which is liver and kidneys, uh, they need to be ha having glucose type two transporters because in a setting of high glucose, I can move uh, glucose inside and store it. In the setting of low glucose, I need to be able to move it out uh, in cells to get it. So that liver and kidney has two-way transporters. And pancreas, why? Because it has beta cells that make mm -hmm. insulin. It has alpha cells, right, in the islands of Lingerhans that make uh, glucagon. And those hormones are secreted based on the glucose concentration. So if glucose is high in the cell, insulin is going to come out. If glucose is low in the cell, glucagon is going to come out to break up those stores right type 2 right are found in liver kidney and pancreas uh where are you five type, type five is okay five um lungs lungs so we remember we're we're dealing with glucose. We're dealing with glucose, and truly speaking, type five they're transporters. Type five they're fructose transporters, and the type five fructose transporters, right? Uh, predominantly, you see them uh, on in the testes, right? And also, right, because sperm utilize a lot of fructose in order for the motility, right, for the uh, um, movement, right, of the tail flagella. So fructose is utilized there. So type 5 is actually fructose trans transporters. You see them a lot of in the testes and utilization by the sperm. So uh, for your purposes, uh, which, what is the takeaways, right? Is, is this. First of all, the only glucose transporters that utilize insulin are, right? Type 4. The type 4 transporters are found in muscle and adipocytes. So of glucose to muscle and fat cells, you must be present. Why? Because these glucose type 4 transporters, they embed in the membrane if insulin, com if insulin comes in. Once insulin comes in, only then the glucose can come to the cell surface for glucose to be absorbed from the bloodstream. If there's no insulin, this is not going to work, right? That's why in setting of diabetes, we give insulin for that to happen. They are found in muscles and right in 
uh, adipocytes. Now, uh, transporters type 1 and 3 are found in central nervous system and red blood cells, but they're not under the mercy of insulin. So your central nervous system must be able to uptake glucose for its functions, right? Uh, and that glucose that's coming into the brain or central nervous system is not under the of insulin. Doesn't matter if you make insulin, you, you don't make insulin. It will take up the glucose in the bloodstream uh, because it has type 3 transporters and type 3 transporters, which is not on the influence of insulin. And then we talked about uh, glucose transporters type 2, right? The hallmark of type 2, they must be able to both taste, right, the environment and secrete the necessary hormone. So pancreas, right, it will utilize the type 2 transporters to check how much glucose is in the extracellular fluid, right? Uh, uh, in order to secrete insulin, if glucose is high, it's going to secrete glucagon if glucose is low. And then the liver, right, and kidney, they do a process called gluconeogenesis, uh, and they also can do uh, uh, glucogenolysis, break down glycogen storage, right? So glucogenolysis means from non-carbohydrates and glucogenolysis glycogens, uh, glycogen stores to make glucose. And it's able to do that uh, in the setting of, uh, right, it, depending if it's hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia. So we find the two-way transporters. And you can the glucose transporters uh, in terms of and where their functions are. Or it's yeah. Next. John, you had a question? Yeah, so why is um one and three not insulin dependent again? Because the reason why they're not insulin dependent, think about this, right? Let's say your brain always utilizing glucose uh, for your cognitive functions, for uh, your uh, metabolic functions of the brain. It was insulin dependent, right? And diabetic who was type one, um, uh, insulin dependent diabetic who does not make insulin is, uh, is basically attacking uh, the pancreas, right? The beta cells and uh, it's autoimmune disease and it's breaking out all the insulin. So there's no insulin that is produced. That person, if he has no glucose coming into the brain, he will pass out. He will pass out and he will not be able to perform any functions uh, of the central nervous system if there's no glucose coming in. For this reason, right, our, um, our body is merciful to, un to basically say that uh, we do not need insulin. It's not under the influence of insulin to, to have glucose coming into the central nervous and red blood cells in order to perform their metabolic functions, right? And red blood cells, right, we need to, their function is to hemoglobin filled with oxygen so that the body can uh, essentially utilize oxygen stores. So it's important that they perform their functions as well. And it's not under influence of insulin because if that was the case, diabetics would not be able to survive. They will basically uh, succumb to their disease processes, right? So this is why. Um, any other questions? All right. So the next thing that I want to talk about is uh, essentially, you know, what you know, we talked about all this business of you know utilizing glucose, you know, glucose from a GI tract. Uh, what are the concentrations? What are the levels? Right. So the whole purpose of this discussion is probably a process called glycolysis, right? tell me like i don't need the whole overview but what is what is this? does anyone know what was the question yeah so i said the whole perp i was just explaining right uh, the glucose is coming in from your uh, diet right going into the hepatic portal vein goes into your circulation right utilization by cells Right? And then we talked about the, these different glucose transporters, right? And then my question was, right, why do I went through all this extent to explain all this to you, right? The whole extent was to basically come to this process of glycolysis. Can anyone tell me what is glycolysis? Isn't that the process that the cells go under to make ATP? The cells to make ATP, right? So, so uh, um, right? So, so that's correct, right? 
Uh, and my next question, you could answer it if you want, right? In your body, right? Which cells perform glycolysis? So which cells? Mitochondria. Uh, only mitochondria? Muscle cells. Uh, Muscle cells. Any other cells? So, so, so to repeat, right? Your body has a lot of cells, uh, muscle cells, liver cells, kidneys, hormonal cells, right? A whole bunch of cells. So my question then goes, which cells in your body perform of glycolysis? And yes, uh, what Christine said, uh, said is correct. We want to all ETP, right? Which is the, but which cells go, use, do glycolysis? Liver cells. Only, only liver cells, right? So uh, it's good that uh, I asked you this. So glycolysis is done by all cells. So glycolysis is such a process that all cells, all cells in your body, all cells in your body, right, perform glycolysis. The ultimate, you know, pathway, right, of glycolysis is basically we take a molecule of glucose, right, glucose, and through the process of glycolysis, we basically want to make, right? So we make ATP here, right? And then there's another molecule, a high uh, electron case. It's NAD plus, it's going to become NADH. And this, right? This into the electron transport chain. So the whole process of glycolysis make two pyruvate molecules. That you could take this into mitochondria. So we're going to say this is your mitochondria. And this can then go into right, your Krebs cycle. Uh, which is going to then go into the electron transport chain. Now, uh, this mitochondria, is it present in this? So do we have mitochondria in all cells? No. Which cells do not? Red blood cells don't have Red blood cells, very good, right? So red blood cells, they do not have mitochondria. So that means that uh, for metabolic functions of red blood cells they stop they stop here right they don't stop here they do not have mitochondria they cannot take this into the krebs cycle and they cannot go into this uh, oxidative phosphorylation uh right in the for chain and and uh what's the ultimate thing here is that the process of glycolysis gives us net net atp right net atp of two so net of two atp and if we have and if we have mitochondria and if we have oxygen we are right we're going to say 32 atp is formed and atp right we we already know right is utilized by cells we i gave you an example of sodium potassium atps right which utilizes atp to get rid of three sodium and bring two potassium in it does so by atp right so we for us to make as much ATP from one single glucose, we actually want to have the mitochondria present and we want to have oxygen present. This whole business of uh, analysis is utilized most efficiently, right? But, okay, so if red blood cells do not have mitochondria, what they do is they take this pyruvate, right, and they make lactate. They do this by lactate dehydrogenase enzyme this enzyme regenerates our nad to nagh so at least in red blood cells in red blood cells this process can regenerate lactate right it makes two eight and this process can uh continue but for red blood cells for their functions right that is sufficient in order to perform uh its duties right uh but all other cells that have mitochondria they have and and we have oxygen present right we have oxygen present, then we could make 32 ATP. So, 
uh so what you will say you know what's so what was for learning all this right so of learning all this was as follows right we learned how to we essentially uh bring glucose from the diet right how the body utilizing the enzymes breaks the uh, multimeric right polysaccharides into monomeric glucose and liver can further right take fructose or galactose and make into and glucose then goes into the process of glucose. the whole purpose of glycolysis in our body is that we want to make atp the reason why we want to make atp is that atp is that for a lot of processes not just AT, sodium potassium atps but a lot of uh processes in our body require energy right for function right if we do not have mitochondria or we do not have the body is then can utilize this way so we cannot make 30 to 32 atp the body is going to then convert this pyruvate into lactate maybe you guys heard of lactic acid and you want acid like when you exercise right your muscles get depleted of oxygen you make a lot of lactate or lactic acid in your in your bloodstream right that's if you go to the gym and you do that you know um workout set for a prolonged time you feel that burn right that lactic acid in your body but in the states of shock and hyperperfusion states when you don't have have enough oxygen right your body will still gonna switch to this lactate form right because it cannot make atp because you don't have oxygen for these relation and so the bottom line is you're going to be only be making this net 2 atp from glycolysis and you're going to start to accumulate lactate right in the uh, uh, shock right any questions about about this as we proceed forward right so if there's no questions right i'm gonna basically go a little bit more in depth of what the stuff we talked about right so we talked about uh, uh, glucose is coming in into our body. We have these glucose transporters that essentially uh, uh, transport a glucose via facilitated diffusion because uh, from the extracellular fluid to the intracellular fluid, right, it cannot just easily come in. It needs to have receptors on the cell surface. We talked about, right, first of all, we said glucose type 4 transporters, they are under influence of insulin. So they see insulin dependent, predominantly found on the muscle cells and the depocytes, right? And for the uptake of glucose. Then we talked about, right, glucose transporters, glucose transporters type one and type three. For your purposes, you want to remember they're found in the central nervous system, right? Red. They also found some in the placenta, right? The, you have in the cornea, but for your purposes, central nervous system and red blood cells is what you need to remember. They are not insulin independent uh we talked about glucose transporters type 2 so they're bi-directional they're two-way trans and they need that in order to sense the glucose in the environment so beta cells of the islands and the lignin horns will liver cells we do have to exchange glycogen stores right and type 5 which is actually fructose transporters and the testes for the motility so this is what you need to know right this is just uh over uh this what as i was explaining this is just the same thing but it's going to be in a form right as your uh polysaccharides are coming and your pancreas right which is uh going to secrete your amylase pancreas to break down um the in the small intestine right uh, the glucose the glucose is going to go through the hepatic port right into your liver right so glucose comes in here and then the glucose is going to go through the hepatic vein is going to go into your central nervous uh, sorry central circulation to circulate or in your body here we see right uh all the organs uh here and the mesenteric uh, um, circulation and the again the hepatic portal vein which takes up glucose why because we don't want to get rid of glucose in our in our digestive tract glucose is very important for our body why because we want to perform this process of glycolysis basically making that atp 30 to 32 atps and we need to uptake 
that's coming from the GI tract from the foods that we consume. Okay? And we do that via utilization of amylase uh, by, by secretion from the pancreas. And then uh, liver is basically then sending it through the hepatic vein into the central circulation. Right? This is just a close that you see the hepatic vein. Glucose will take its way all the way to this, and this is going to the inferior vena cava into the, the circulation. Right? This is just another schematic view. Right? Now, uh, as I was saying, uh, this glucose that's now coming in, right? Uh, the whole purpose of the, the six carbon glucose, the cells need to be able to do glycolysis from it. And they do glycolysis to extract ATP. Most ATP, as I said, we need to have, this is mitochondria, by the way. And to extract the most ATP, we need to be able to send this glucose via the citric acid cycle to make these carriers NADH and F. ADH2 so that it can go into the electron transport chain to pump out the max amount of ATP. Uh, red blood cells, right, they stop here. Red blood cells cannot um, have oxidative phosphorus because they don't have mitochondria in them. So they stop their process here, right? And uh, um, right, we see the muscle cell, right, the glycogen stores. Uh, and liver has glycogen stores. Usually, you could store this in the muscle, but the muscle glycogen stores is only for the muscle. That's see the muscle cell break down their glycogen and releasing into the bloodstream because they're miss, missing a key in uh, glucose six phosphatase. Liver can in fact, you know, bring glucose into right the central circuit, and this is what all our cells right all our cells perform glycolysis, and we need that in our body. Right to do to do that. This is just a close-up view, right, of all the processes explaining, right, and uh, this is essentially right uh, utilizing the stores of glucose. We can also break out uh, triglycerides, which can go into glycerol, and the bottom common pathway, right, will for us will be right sending into the uh, mitochondria in order to generate as much ATP as possible. Right. So this shows you. Uh, all the different uh, molecules that we can employ in order to get this process of uh, oxidative phosphorylation to occur, right? We could employ uh, uh, acids, we can employ fatty acids, we can employ uh, glucose, right? Which is coming in from the diet. And the whole purpose, right, is this pathway, right? So glycolysis is our primary in order to uh, form, right? And this is just this is this is the schematic overview right so you have all the nutrients coming in they get broken down to this nutrient pool right of amino acids right simple sugars and lipids uh, fatty acids right simple sugars being glucose and why do we need it the whole purpose of metabolism right the whole purpose of all this we need to be this glucose uh into our right um, mitochondria in order to generate ATP to drive all the energy um, uh, energy ut utilization by the cells in our body. For example, driving that sodium potassium ATPase, right? Uh, and if you if you want to, we see right. This is the whole uh, point of glycolysis, right? You don't need to know all the steps, but uh, kind of simplify it. Uh, for you, you basically take this glucose, which is a certain sugar, right? And your body basically initially, as it brings in that sugar, right, via glut transporters, right? The first process is to basically phosphorylate. So the phosphate will not allow the sugar now, right, from the cell, trapped. This glucose is trapped in the cell, right? It goes through these enzymes pathways uh, and the whole purpose of this pathway is basically to ATP in the glycolysis, we, not ATP, because you take you used used to ATP initially in this in this step and this step, and then you make four ATPs per right two pyruvate molecules because you have two of the same ones occurring at the same time, and your net gain is two ATP 
send this pyruvate to the mitochondria, right? And the mitochondria, right, the pyruvate carbon, it becomes two carbon acetyl CoA, the citric acid cycle, make these high energy carriers, right? NADH, right? We make three of them. We make this FADH2. This gets into the electron transport chain here, right? Through this uh, electron transport chain, uh, it's going to um, basically pump out potassium. These, this, right, was an ADH. So it's going to pump out the potassium, uh, sorry, uh, hydrogen ions. Uh, and it, this will, this can take this, the, uh, eight, uh, the ATP, right, synthase which will generate ATP in the mitochondria. So hopefully we'll get this 30 to 32 ATP forming when we have oxygen and we have mitochondria and everything is functioning right, right? So uh, this is just a close up view how it works. Uh, again, the, the, the person actually who discovered this uh, uh, ATP synthase, which is found in the mitochondria, his name was Mitchell. He actually won a Nobel, right, for but. Uh, why am I harping on all this, right? So this this is basically how this these energy carriers are going through the mitochondria. They release oxygen stores that is carried here, right? And then through this ATPase, right? This the hydrogen is going to be pumped here, and this the turbine that basically turns it is going to generate ATP that we see, uh, right? We utilize it. So this is whole process, the whole over. Uh, the bottom line is you net right thirty to thirty two ATP for u utility by our body right. So the whole purpose of this right is uh, anyone of you uh, heard of uh, shock shock. What kind of shock? Sub. Yeah, some shock. Sub. Right. So. Uh, uh, in, in sepsis, right, you have bacteria that's now free-flowing in your body, right, uh, septicemia, and then if it's not treated, you're going to go into septic shock. In the hospital, right, in the hospital, not not just for this shock, but specifically for septic shock, measure lact, lac, lactate level, lactate, right? And uh, why do you suppose that is? Because uh, the infection uh, interferes with the metabolism, so... Oh. Your body may make energy using the pyruvate uh, uh, mechanism instead of the regular one or something. Like yeah. So, so in in uh, in uh, sepsis, right? You also have fever, right? And when you have fever, your cells, all your cells are gonna have a, uh, utility of glucose, and they have higher metabolic demand, right? So you have fever, you have bacteria in your body, so all your cells want more ATP, they want more sugar, right? That's what, that's what's occurring. But the problem that's occurring in that state, you also have profound vasodilation. So if you have profound vasodilation, your blood pressure drops, right? That's why they call it septic shock. You go in shock. So if your blood pressure drops, do you think you could circulate blood, right? With all the nutrients, your organs, um, just as well or not? Not. So, so if you don't, do not have that circulation, what happens is your cells become starved of oxygen and nutrients. So your body switches from aerobic uh, respiration and aerobic. So your body starts to taking this, taking it into the right mitochondria and, and making a uh, boatload of ATP. It takes this pyruvate into lactate, into lactate. And this does, and not because you have lack of oxygen and you have by the tissues uh, and this lactate starts to accumulate right so in sepsis right they said that uh, in septic shock lactate concentration right the normal range is between 1.4 to 0.3 millimolar moles per liter because right your red blood cells they don't have mitochondria so there's some lactate that's formed uh, your muscles right if you're moving lactate right but the normal level is low but the moment number starts to increase, right, in state of shock, we can now tell that the person has switched from aeration to anaerobic respiration. So the moment they switch to respiration, they're making more lactate, 
we could trend this to see, right, that they're raising uh, their glucose to the optimal level, right? That's why, especially for sepsis, right, they say, right, the bundle, you're going to measure lactate level. So the reason why I was bringing all this up, right, you know, you'll say this glycolysis business, why, you know, who cares, right? So the being is that for you to correct the sepsis for this patient, you need to restore the body's ability to regenerate, right, uh, that ATP. And the only way you could do this is we need to have the oxygen and we need to have mitochondria functional in order to make that ATP for, ut for utility of all your cells, such as you know, sodium, potassium, ATPs, and other functions, right? So that's why we level the moment the lactate starts to increase, right? We know there's something wrong. That's why they will say, right, in, uh, in, a, in septic condition, we want to first measure the initial level. If it's above 2 millimolar per liter, right, we he's in some sort of shock state. But the moment he starts to exceed this level, we know we got to give him crystal fluids so that we could circulate, right, the, uh, with the nutrients to the tissues. We want to give him antibiotics to fight that infection. Uh, and we want to increase his blood pressure, right, greater than 65 with util utilization of pressor, right, so that the body hopefully restores, uh, right, that uh, flow of nutrients and oxygen to the uh, starved tissues of the body. And this is what they say, basically. The lactate is a measure of uh, right, um, how much of shock is going to be going into a hypoxic state, how, how much your tissues have become hypoxic. So the more lactate you are forming, uh, the, the more hypoxic your tissues are. This having sepsis guidelines, right, in 2021, they said that Lactate is an important biomarker of tissue hypoxia and dysfunction. So you may have lactate secretion not only in a state of septic shock, you have se uh, lactate shock, right? You may have a shock, you know, hypovolemic shock and other states of shock. Why? You have tissue hypoxia and from aerobic metabolism to anaerobic, right? Aerobic, you were making about, you know, 32 ATP, right? Anaerobic. You're now making about two ATP, so you see the difference, right? Which state do I want to be in? I want to be in aerobic state because I want to drive all the functions of my, of my system, right? But the switch to anaerobic, my lactic, my lactate is increasing, like lactate is going off. So serum lactate level, right? It tells you, right? It's important biomarker for tissue hypoxia, right? This, this is this is the cut point, right? This is essentially of um, glycolysis. You take the six carbons, go all the way down, right, to uh, to send it into your uh, mitochondria, but but in a setting of low oxygen, you start to make lactate. But uh, the reason why I, I was is that I want you to be cognizant when you go to your ER rotation, right? They'll say, okay, patient in bed seven, he's coming in for right. We got to check level. Right, take your, um, you know, uh, blood cultures and your tubes. You know, I would like you to draw blood for that patient, right? So the reason why you're drawing lactate is that it's a surrogate marker of tissue hypoxia, and that is what's producing, right, when you don't have oxygen, right, with normal of glycolysis. That's why that process is important to understand. Any questions about uh, this and why is important for us? Right, so the the point being, right, uh, you want to correct the underlying condition uh, and restore, um, right, metabolism for the person. So this this is the fate of pyruvate, right? How does the glucose get broken, which we consume, right? We wanted to go to the acetyl CoA. We wanted to make you know both load of it, but in the setting, if you don't have oxygen or you don't have mitochondria blood cells right you're going to take this pathway into the lactate form and this is this is right lactic acid that's built up right so uh the in the nutshell right to sum up right what's the reason we utilize glycogen uh, so, uh, sorry why we break down glycogen or uh the starch that we consume 
right? Why do we break down to glucose? The purpose of that is this, this glucose, the six carbon sugar, right? Is basically it's easily utilized by the body. How does it, how is it utilized by the body? It's utilized through this process of glycolysis. The whole, the whole process of glycolysis, uh, we want to make of ATP. The only way we can do it is we need to have oxygen present, right? O2, and we need to have present, right? And one is, when this is all present, we could make 30, 30, all cells are happy, right? They're under aerobic. In uh, glucose, if you have a lot of glucose coming in, we can also store it as glycogen, right? Why is this glycogen important, right? Especially your liver, right? And, um, you know, your kidney stores it, your muscles store it, but muscles cannot really get rid of it, right? The reason why this glycogen is important is that in the, in the kidneys, when you have low, low glucose levels, right? Uh, this hormone, which is under glucose type 2, right, transporter, glucagon, there's low sugar. Glucagon is going to be released by the pancreas, right, by the alpha cells. It's going to act on these uh, liver and kidney cells, eat glycogen stores into form of glucose, so then we, right? So same thing, right, when you're going to learn medication called glucagon in your, pharma, in your medication kit. We give glucagon in those conditions where we are unable to gain IV access and the person has sh lower sugar, less than 60, right? We give them uh, glucagon and glucagon have these glycogen stores. Hopefully there is glycogen stores in the liver and uh, kidneys and basically then circulate as glucose. Okay? So the glucose can be mobilized, right? And it's uh, with the process of glucogenolysis. Lysis is breakdown of and uh, liver and kidney can also have uh, this process called gluconeogenesis, right? Gluconeogenesis. It's basically formation of glucose from non-carbohydrate sources. Uh, the main reason, as I was explaining to you, the util utilization of glucose was basically uh, the whole purpose of this is that we're taking complex carbohydrates, we're breaking them into the glucose so that the body can take this glucose into the process of glycolysis, and in the presence of mitochondria and oxygen, we could basically power all the cells with this ATP, right? Which is about 30 to 32 when oxygen and uh, mitochondria is present, right? So this is basically the major reason why we need glucose in our body. Uh, we obtain it via diet, right? And uh, it powers, right, our uh, processes in the cells. So this is where I concluded it. Um, any questions about the process of uh, glycolysis, glucose transporters, uh, or anything we talked about thus far. Yeah, Nico, uh, the glyconeogenesis, you said the source of glucose comes from elsewhere, and that's where it got cut yeah. off. What uh, other sources did you mean? Other sources, right? So the, the, the word neo means, so when you say gluconeo, neo means new sources other than glucose. So the new right. sources being certain um, gl glucogenic amino acids and uh -huh. fatty acids. And uh -huh. liver is able to employ those uh, sources in order to uh, make glucose so that it can send it into the pathway of uh, glycolysis. Uh, when does it do it? When the glucose storage are low, right? When in the setting of hypoglycemia, for example. When okay. we do endocrine chapter, we're going to go into in depth about that. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, but for the purposes now, uh, remember, glucose is the primary uh, currency for your cells. All right, so we, um, if there's no questions, right, uh, uh, we're going to continue forward. You don't need to know all the, you know, steps of glycolysis. What I would like you to know is that we basically, the glucose that comes in, we make two py pyruvate out of it in the process of glycolysis. And if you have mitochondria, this pyruvate is then is going to become acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA is going to be utilized in centric acid cycle. Another name is Krebs cycle. Maybe you heard that. This happens if you see this is in the mitochondria. And then uh, this Krebs cycle, you basically move these high energy carriers, NADH, FADH2, which carry these hydrogens and into the electron transport chain, and you make 30 to 32 ATP. That's what the goal is with glucose. That's what we're trying to get.